Hi, good evening. Welcome to our webinar sponsored by our Spirit of Women program at Inspira Health entitled Aches and Veins, Your Vascular Health Matters. I'm Laurie Trungone, the Assistant Vice President of Women's and Children here at Inspira Health. I'd like to thank you for attending tonight and once again, uh, uh, spot being help, helping us sponsor these programs. We have a great presentation for you tonight. We are once again using the ON24 platform that has fun and interactive aspects to it that allows you to play and make what you see very personal so that you can have the best experience for you. All the windows on your screen are resizable and movable. So feel free to move them around and get the most out of your experience. You can enlarge the slides by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. And you can make an online request for an appointment right on your screen. Feel free to click around and explore while you're enjoying the program tonight. At the bottom of your screen, there are multiple engagement tools you can use. Using the toolbars, you, can be, you will be able to download the slides and the other resources that we have available for you. You can view the bio of our speaker tonight. And as usual, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the event using the Q&A button. Your questions will be visible only to us and your identity remains anonymous. So we hope you'll feel comfortable asking whatever's on your mind. Throughout the presentation, you'll see poll questions pop up on your screen. All of your responses will be anonymous and we encourage you to participate. You can have some fun and contribute at the same time. So this presentation is being recorded and an on-demand version will be available to you by tomorrow using the same audience link you just used to join us tonight. So, okay, let's get started. It's my privilege to introduce to you our present presenter tonight. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Holly Graves. She's a vascular surgeon practicing at Inspira Medical Group Surgical Associates in Vineland. She's originally from Michigan and attended the University of Michigan and then medical school at the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. She completed her residency at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. She's board certified in both vascular surgeon, surgery and general surgery. She provides a full range of vascular surgical services and procedures, including endovascular and open surgical arterial interventions for peripheral artery disease, limb salvage, as well as aortic disease. She does carotid procedures, venous ablations, and wound care, including lymphedema evaluations. She was named a South Jersey top doc in 2019, and we're very proud to have her as a member of our Inspiro Medical Group team of physicians and providers. So welcome, Dr. Graves. Thank you very much for having me. I hope you all enjoy the talk. So we'd like to start tonight by asking you a poll question, um, just to see where we are and where we need to go tonight. So an artery is a blood vessel that carries blood from the heart to other parts of the body. So this is just true or false, and we'll give you a moment to respond and see where we are and how much we need to explore tonight. So we'll give you another couple of seconds. And then let's move to true. 100% uh, of our audience uh, thinks that an artery is a blood vessel uh, that carries blood to other parts of your body. So Dr. Graves, can you tell us a little bit about arteries and veins? Yes, so the arteries bring the blood from the heart to the feet and the veins bring the blood back from the feet up to the heart. So as you can see in this diagram here, um, the uh, major blood vessels that we concentrate on are the blood vessels of the pelvis as well as the blood vessels of the lower legs. Uh, in the uh, venous system, there are both a deep system as well as a superficial venous system. Um, and each uh, vein is outlined differently on the slides, as you can see. Very good. So when we talk about healthcare and issues related to our bodies, we hear about problems related to these arteries and veins, right? And as you just explained, this is our vascular system. Can you tell us what problems can be or more specifically what vascular disease really does mean? So vascular disease is any abnormality of the arteries or the veins. Um, so in the arteries, you know, the arteries can experience uh, blockages or narrowings, which decreases the flow to the feet and other parts of the body. Uh, the veins can also uh, 
encounter blockages as well. Vascular disease can occur anywhere in the body, um, including the heart as well as the um, blood vessels going to the brain. Okay, so are there symptoms uh, that we need to know about or should be aware of? So oftentimes patients will describe symptoms in terms of arterial disease as they can only walk one to two blocks before either their thigh, their calf, or their buttock uh, starts cramping on them. Oftentimes the, when stopping, the, the pain will cease. Um, but it's pretty reproducible in terms of the pain that these, you know, the patients feel, um, you know, the, the limitations in terms of their block, uh, walking is pretty consistent. Sometimes the symptoms are worse with inclines. Um, sometimes patients can experience leg numbness or weakness. Uh, when feeling the feet, one foot may be cooler than the other, though some patients just have cold feet and that is normal. Uh, if there is a wound on your foot or your toes that doesn't heal over a, a prolonged period of time, that is not normal, and that can be a sign of arterial disease. Sometimes the color of the leg can change, so the foot can become purple or blue or pale. Sometimes the distribution of hair or the nail growth can be altered. Um, toenails can be um, abnormal. The skin over your legs can become shiny. Um, if you feel the pulses in your legs, you may notice that when you feel the pulses in your foot, there may be a discrepancy between your right and your left foot. So, you know, when we talk about anything related to our bodies, right, our fear is always, what if this gets worse? You know, can you tell if the disease is progressing and then what should people do? So when the disease progresses, oftentimes patients will say that uh, at night I wake up and I have to dangle my leg over the bed. Uh, sometimes patients wake up in the middle of the night with horrible cramping of their leg. Uh, this is different than restless leg syndrome. This is true and true pain, not the feeling just to move the leg. Um, again, oftentimes patients will say they have to hang their leg over the bed um, to relieve the pain because that puts the leg in the defendant position. So due to gravity alone, the, the blood flow is going to flow um, increasingly to the foot. Um, so worsening pain, worsening numbness um, are a, a sign that the disease process can be worsening. And if you're at all concerned that you're having pain in your legs, or um, something that has changed over the past few months, you know, it's, it's important to make an appointment to be evaluated. We always tell our audience that screening is always a good idea. We've had webinars on just screening alone, um, and it can help prevent issues from getting too far out of control, or better yet, we can catch issues before, they even, before we even know there's a problem. So what are the guidelines for screening for vascular disease? So for vascular disease, since there's been more and more minimally invasive ways of screening for vascular disease, um, so patients with increasing age, um, so over 65, oftentimes insurance companies will offer a screen or even hospitals or there's various um, uh, physician groups that will offer screening uh, patients over 65. Uh, patients with a history of diabetes or patients with a history of smoking and over the age of 50, you know, the diabetes and smoking are significant risk factors. So screen, uh, screening is recommended at a, a, a younger age. Um, patients with obesity, high blood pressure, uh, other risk factors in terms of maybe a family member that's had an aneurysm, uh, you know, heart disease in a family member at a young age or a patient uh, that's in their 40s that has already had a heart attack. Those would all be indications for screening. So now that people are screened and know what those guidelines are, let's first talk about our arteries and then we can move into issues related to our veins. Do we know what the causes of peripheral artery disease are? So the causes of peripheral artery disease, the main risk factor, again, is smoking. Um, even in patients that smoked in their younger years when it was considered normal and no one said or thought that smoking was bad, you can see them now in their 70s and 80s with the effects of smoking. Diabetes is horrible on the blood vessels, uh, particularly the micro um, vasculature, the teeny, teeny blood vessels in the, in the toes. 
obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Again, you see increasing incidence of vascular disease with age just because as everything in someone's body ages, so does the blood vessels. Um, family history is very important. Uh, high levels of homocysteine. So uh, recent research has shown that uh, it's possible that higher levels of homocysteine in the blood may correlate with an increased risk of peripheral vascular disease. Um, and this is just a diagram here showing how peripheral vascular disease uh, develops. So basically there's inflammation in the blood vessel and there's these fatty deposits that can develop within the wall that cause these narrowings. And these plaques can actually rupture or bleed into themselves and cause, you know, a worsening, a worsening blockage. So as with any issues related to our bodies, when there's something outside of what is considered normal, there are very often complications related to that. What are the complications related to having peripheral artery disease? So when uh, there is peripheral arterial disease of the arteries of the pelvis or the legs, there's decreased blood flow to the levels of the leg below that. So if there's disease of the arteries of the pelvis, oftentimes there's problems with the buttocks or the thighs. If there's blockages in the thighs, there's oftentimes pain in the calves. Um, so what can happen over time as these blockages get worse and worse, especially if patients are still smoking or their diabetes is not controlled, um, patients can develop pain at rest or what we call rest pain. Patients can develop wounds that won't heal, which is a, a big problem because if the wounds become infected, it can ultimately you know, lead to worsening wounds um, and being in the hospital for, for bad infections. Um, I explain peripheral vascular disease to my patients as almost like a field effect. So whenever you see a blockage in the leg, you can also have it in any uh, blood vessel bed in the body, so the heart or the neck. So if you have a blockage in the heart, you can have a heart attack. If you have a blockage in the arteries of your neck, you can have stroke. Oh, wow. So how about testing then? You know, we don't certainly don't want to be to the point where we're having a stroke. Um, can we, what are the tests that we can use to diagnose peripheral vascular disease so that we know if we have an issue or not? So when I see a patient in my office, I, I go from head to toe, so physical exam. So I'll, you know, I'll look at the person, you know, see what is, the, you know, are they thin? Are they cachectic? Are they obese? Can they walk? Do they need a wheelchair? Can they walk with a cane? Do they walk with a walker? Who do they live with? Um, you know, and then I check all the pulses. I listen to the neck to see if there's abnormality in the neck or what's called a brewery signifying abnormal flow of blood. I listen to the heart, the lungs. I feel the abdomen as well as listen to the abdomen to see if there's any abnormally large blood vessels. I feel the uh, pulses in the, the groin area that's called the femoral artery the popliteal artery, the artery behind the knee, as well as there's two arteries in the feet that we feel as well. Um, there is a non-invasive way of looking at the blood vessels, which basically looks at the speed of the blood flow in the vessels to estimate any significant stenoses or blockages. There's blood tests to look at the, um, you know, your hemoglobin A1C or an estimate of your blood sugars over, you know, uh, the past few months. We can test the, your lipid levels, your cholesterol levels, homocysteine levels. Um, the ankle brachial index is just an alternative way to screen for vascular disease where we basically um, compare the ratio of the blood flow to the arms to the blood flow of the feet. And with that number we generate, we can estimate the degree of blockages and where the blockages are. Um, and then angiography is kind of the gold standard where we're able to look at the blockages as well as treat them in the same setting. And how about Dopplers? Do you do, can you do Dopplers? So the arterial Doppler is a excellent tool to use in the office. Um, when I cannot feel a pulse in the foot, I can listen to it. Um, so for anyone that's, that's had a, you know, had a baby and been pregnant when they put the, the ultrasound on the belly and you can hear the heartbeat of the baby, it's the same sort of thing. I can hear the heartbeat of your foot. 
Um, and by listening to the tone of it, you know, how loud it is, as well as the quality of it, what it sounds like, I can estimate how bad the blockages are um, up top. And it's a minimally invasive way, simple thing to do in the office. And that's what it looks like, just a, a box with a, basically I use some gel and just a, basically a little wand to, to listen. So um, how about this? Is this the same um, or is this a little bit more involved? So the arterial Doppler study, the full study, um, and there's different names for that. Sometimes it's referred to as an ABI, an arterial brachial index. Sometimes you hear the word PVR, um, pulse volume recordings. It's, you know, there's different nomenclature amongst physicians as well as vascular lab technicians. But so for the full study, they, um, the vascular techs will basically put blood pressure cuffs all up and down your legs. Um, and what they're doing is comparing the blood flow from all those blood pressure cuffs to the blood flow in your arm or the pressure. And they do that through the, the blood pressure. Um, so there's, you can see here on the left, those are kind of the numbers we use to screen. And ultimately the number we use is the arterial brachial index, the ABI. And what we do is we measure the pressures of the foot and the ankle. So the dorsalis pedis, that's on the top of the foot and the posterior tibial artery, that's just by your ankle. Um, and we compare the pressure of those two pulses to the pressure in your arm to generate a number. So a uh, number of over 0 0.9 is, is usually considered normal. However, in patients with severely calcified arteries or non-compressible arteries, you can get arter artificially elevated arterial brachial indices. Um, there is a range of peripheral vascular disease, 0 0.4 to 0 0.9. Uh, once you get less than 0 0.4, we consider that uh, critical limb ischemia or critical vascular disease. However, I've seen patients walking around completely asymptomatic with an ABI of 0 0.4. So when looking at these numbers, you have to take into consideration the patient. How is the patient doing? Are they having symptoms? I would never treat a patient just based off of a number. Yeah. And that's so bad. If a patient were to get screened and they were to come back with an abnormal number, um, that is not grounds to freak out and think that you need a major vascular procedure. Yes, you may want to see a vascular surgeon and have that vascular surgeon keep an eye on your numbers over time. But unless a patient is having problems, vascular surgeons do not operate on numbers alone. That's good to know because that all sounds like pretty scary, right? So, so is it curable? Let's ask the audience first what they think. Can, can you cure peripheral vascular disease? We'll give you a few seconds to respond and then we'll let Dr. Graves tell us if you're correct. Let's see, I'll give you another couple of minutes or seconds. And then we can move on to see what we can do about any of this. Okay, so. We have about a 50-50 split. 44.4% of you think that it is curable um, and 55.6% think that it is not. So let's have Dr. Graves tell us if, if it is or isn't and what the treatment options might be. So go ahead. So I agree with the, the, the polars. So I, <laughs> there are certain forms that are treatable. So if you come to me with a blockage in your leg and I stent it or balloon it, it's treated for that point in time. However, like we talked about before, the same problem that caused that blockage in your thigh can affect the blood vessels anywhere. So in my opinion, once you're diagnosed with peripheral vascular disease, you should see a vascular surgeon for life um, just to keep surveillance on what's going on everywhere in your body. Um, you know, we can treat blockages, not all blockages we can treat 100%, but we can try to make them better. But again, those blockages can recur, especially if a patient is smoking. Um, and even if patients aren't smoking, no, you know, balloons aren't perfect, stents aren't perfect, we're not perfect. So again, if a patient's diagnosed with peripheral vascular disease, it's it's a lifelong commitment uh, to following 
with a with a vascular surgeon. Okay. So some um, other just to, go into, um, just to go back, sorry. So, but what you okay. what you can do and how we do treat this. Um, so smoking cessation. Anyone that comes into my office that is still smoking, um, we talk about it. I I I, I don't yell at patients. Um, I know it's very difficult, but I try to support my patients and give them whatever resources they can. Uh, medical therapy, so aspirin, a baby aspirin every day. Um, I don't think there's really a difference between a baby aspirin and a full strength aspirin. Uh, statin, so when you see the commercials, they say it's a lipid lowering agent or it's for um, hypercholesterol, but Really, the reason I prescribe it is it, it tames down the inflammation of the blood vessels. So even if a patient has no high cholesterol at all and their cholesterol levels are fine, I will still put them on a statin. Um, so the statins are Crestor, Lipitor, or the you know generics Atorvastatin, Simvastatin, there's Pravastatin. Um, the main complications of these medications are muscle aches as well as um, liver abnormalities. So patients need to follow up with their primary care doctors in terms of monitoring their liver enzymes uh, when they're on these medications. There's various doses. Uh, I oftentimes will put them on a moderate to high dose uh, if they can tolerate it. Um, but for the most part, all my patients are on at least an aspirin uh, and a statin. Uh, a walking program. So this is very important. This is in the guidelines for the Society of Vascular Surgery or the guiding body of vascular surgeons. So we encourage patients before really doing any major surgical procedures to um, do a walking program. So three times a week, the goal is 30 minutes. You walk, you may get some pain, you can stop, but then you walk again. And what this does is it, it um, promotes the body to make alternative pathways for blood flow or collateral pathways around the narrowings or the blockages that a patient may have. I've, I have multiple patients that actually the, the, the artery in their thigh is completely blocked, but their body has made these new pathways that they don't even, they don't even feel it. Um, so they're, they don't need an intervention. And actually, Inspira has a peripheral arterial disease physical therapy walking program that you can do in the hospital. And it's very regimented, um, and it's, it's, it's excellent. So that is something that uh, I definitely have referred my patients to. Uh, again, like we mentioned before, the field effects. So uh, as part of the treatment for peripheral arterial disease, I always send my patients to be evaluated by a cardiologist and I screen the other vascular beds, even they, though they may not be symptomatic. So here are some other perhaps treatments for vascular disease. So this is just a, a, a broad um, idea of what we offer for vascular disease. So obviously, you know, we encourage a healthy diet. We encourage exercise, the walking program we talked about, um, the medicines we talked about. So you want to optimize your risk factors. You want your blood pressure to be controlled with blood pressure medications. You know, sometimes for various reasons, we have patients on antiplatelets such as Plavix or blood thinners, Xarelto, Eliquis, Coumadin. Uh, the cholesterol medications, the statins we talked about. Um, in acute situations where a blood clot forms acutely or right then and there in a blood vessel, um, you know, we can give TPA or lysis or clot dissolving medications. Those are usually reserved for emergencies. Um, so in terms of, you know, bringing someone to the the interventional radiology suite or, you know, some, it's comparable to the cath lab. Uh, you know, we can put a balloon in the artery. We can put a stent in the artery. And I'll get into more detail about what we can do to the arteries in the, in the lab. Um, and then there's also traditional open surgical procedures that we can do to open up the blood vessels. So what about... Um you know, the infamous arthrectomy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, so uh, on top of balloons and stents, and again, the balloons come in various sizes. There's also drug coated balloons that are some of the newer technologies, just like the drug balloons that you see, uh, you know, the cardiologist using in the heart. Um, there's various forms of stents in terms of, you know, 
um, covered stents with fabric, bare metal stents in terms of just having metal, drug coated stents where they actually have just like the balloon special drugs in there. The rotor rooter is actually a special device that we can, you know, just like your plumbing, you know, we can take a small device and put it in the blood vessel and bust up the calcium and the plaque and suck it up. Um, so, you know, for blockages that are 100% occluded, um, this allows us to open up a blood vessel that otherwise would not allow to be opened up. And we we hear a lot about bypasses. Can you tell us about that? So uh, not all blood vessels can be opened up using the um, balloons and stents. Traditionally in the groin area, those op areas have to be operated on as well as blockages behind the knee just because we don't like to place stents past areas of flexion or you know the, the joints. So uh, for bypasses, we can use your own vein, we can use material, or we can use a cryopreserve vein or a vein that someone who has passed has donated for someone else to use. We can do bypasses from the groin to the foot, from the groin to above the knee, a groin to below the knee, from the groin to the groin. There's many forms of bypasses that we're able to do. And the bypasses are, are actually um, have a long patency for the most part, meaning they, they stay open for, for many years. So we, you know, as with anything else with our heart, we know we hear a lot about smoking and quitting smoking. Um, how about foods? Are there specific foods um, that will be able to promote a healthy vascular system? So um, this slide shows a, a few of the foods that are considered in the heart healthy diet. So salmon, olive oil instead of butter, oats, spinach, blueberries, um, and actually uh, there is a nutritionist that you can make an appointment with to uh, be counseled um, at Inspira Hospital. And the nutritionist actually, um, that's what they do. They're dedicated to helping patients with a, with a healthy diet. Um, so I, I highly encourage uh, my patients as well as whoever is, you know, is watching this, if you, if you need help with your diet, I encourage you to reach out to the Inspira Nutrition Program. Thank you. So how about, you know, is this just a disease of, of older people, of our, our more senior um, audience, or is this really something that anybody can get? So uh, it's important to realize that young patients can also have vascular disease. So some people are born with vascular problems. The aorta is narrowed. Um, their artery is entrapped by the muscles. Um, or the vein. Sometimes there are cysts that can develop around the artery. Uh, some patients, their muscles become so swollen when they exercise that it cuts off their own blood flow. So just because someone is young, we shouldn't discount their symptoms. And so anyone you know that is younger watching this, if you, if you do have any concerns, you know vascular surgeons are open to everyone. Um, patients that have a normal pulse can also have arterial narrowings or blockages. So if you're having pain or you're worried see a vascular surgeon, um, please don't hesitate. And when you, if you see your primary care, please make mention of these and even tell your primary care physician, I, I wanna be evaluated by a vascular surgeon and they'll have no problem sending you. Okay, so we've talked now a lot about our arteries. Um, we know, you know, just based on the first slide that we saw the arteries and veins, that there's probably issues with our veins as well. So can you tell us a little bit about chronic venous insufficiency? So uh, vein disease has a wide range of, of symptoms and um, uh, in terms of what the legs can look like. So the most common thing is a swollen leg. So patients with leg swelling, oftentimes it's related to the veins not working. So the way I describe the veins not working or venous insufficiency is the blood's supposed to go from the foot up to the heart and the veins. The valves keep the blood flowing in one direction. When the valves don't work for whatever reason, blood flow can go in the wrong way. That's venous insufficiency. So you can see swollen legs, you can see skin changes or, or texture changes in the skin. It can become really tight and uh, darkened uh, related to the deposit of old blood in that region, most typically in the area by the medial malleolar region or the middle part of your ankle, the inner part of your ankle. Uh, the worst case scenario is venous stasis ulcers or non-healing wounds. And again, it's in that same distribution of around the ankle. So we also hear an awful lot about spider veins um, and varicose veins. Let's, let's first look at spider veins and tell us a little bit about that. So spider veins are the um, small veins that are prominent. Um, their technical name is telangiectasias. 
The reticular veins are a little larger. Um, these are the veins that are also, you know, a little bit more prominent that you can see through the skin. Sometimes they can protrude from the skin. Sometimes they can bleed in larger patches. They can be painful. Okay, so let's ask the audience another question. Um, varicose veins, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, are they caused by crossing your legs for extended periods of time? So, you know, I'm sure all of our mothers have told us this and not to do this for that reason. So let's see if our audience thinks that that is a reason for varicose veins. So we'll give you a second or two to respond, and then we'll learn whether or not that's a, a true true statement or a wives tale that we've been told. So our audience thinks that 28% of us think that that is true, that you can get varicose veins from crossing your legs. Um, and about 71% uh, percent think that that is not true. So Dr. Graves, let us know about varicose veins and if that is in fact a true or false statement. So the theoretical concern of crossing your legs all the time is that by crossing one leg over the other, you could theoretically be compressing a vein. But in my opinion, I don't think that that can lead to varicose veins over time. I think that varicose veins um, can run in families. They can be related to damage from a prior blood clot. Um, they can just happen. Um, patients that are on their feet a lot. Um, but I, I don't think even though it's encouraged oftentimes not to cross your legs, I don't think that that's the sole reason that a patient would develop um, varicose veins. Um, so you can see on the slide for this to your left, uh, that is a very common area for varicose veins. That is in the greater saphenous vein area. Um, these are what are we call varicosities. That's very common um, place as well as the uh, middle part of your calf, the inner part of the calf. The back part of your calf is related to what's called the smaller saphenous vein. Um, and then the, the third most common is on the top part of the thigh and oftentimes it'll snake down the lateral or the um, outer part of the knee and that's the anterior accessory saphenous vein. And these are all veins that I can easily treat with minimally invasive uh, procedure. So as with anything, right, uh, things can can progress. Um, so can you walk us through the progression of varicose veins? So there's a uh, basically a, a scoring system that we use. It's called the C classification. So when you you know you research veins on lines, you may come across uh, come across this. So uh, C zero or clinical stage zero is just a normal leg, no visible signs of, of vein disease. So, I mean, at some point, someone's gonna develop some sort of venous abnormality. So C1 is just the telangiectasias or the spider veins, and the reticular veins. C2 is getting, you know, the wormy veins, the veins that protrude, the varicose veins, and they can be of varying degrees of severity. C3 is edema or leg swelling. C4 is when you run into the skin changes, so hyperpigmentation, the skin gets dark. Um, lipodermatosclerosis, that basically means the, the skin gets really tight at the ankle, it gets shiny, and it can be painful. It, it occurs in acute and chronic form. So acute meaning happening now or chronic, it's happening over a long period of time. Atrophy blanchi is just a, a fancy way of saying there's a bunch of um, white and pink blotches on the skin, and it's just basically oversized capillaries in normal skin. Um, C5 is a healed venous stasis ulcer, and C6 is an active venous stasis ulcer. So are there known risk factors? Like, you know, what can we do um, or not do related to varicose veins? So uh, as we talked about, people that have been on, standing on their feet all the time are at increased risk just because there's higher pressure when you're standing on your feet in the lower part of the leg. History of inflammation of the vein or phlebitis. Varicose veins are more common in females, patients with a family history. So oftentimes my patients will say, you know, my mom or my grandma had horrible veins. Um, venous ulcers. So men and people with increased age are at higher risk. Hypertension, diabetes, obesity, CHF, renal insufficiency. So anything that can cause worsening swelling is gonna be, um, you know, compound the severity of a venous stasis ulcer. And those are, you know, CHF and renal insufficiency and obesity. Rheumatoid arthritis, just cause there's worsening inflammation. Oftentimes these patients are on immunosuppressants. Um, and then a uh, history of DVT. So oftentimes patients that have had a DVT, their valves are destroyed, so they have bad reflux. 
So I know that there are treatments, but we have a question um, in our Q&A, which I usually wait to the end for, but um, I think this is a good time to ask the question, can we prevent varicose veins? So uh, I'm gonna get into this in a few slides. I recommend using compression stockings, um, okay. you know, especially when you're, when you're on your feet, elevating your legs. But in some patients, it, you know, patients with a strong family history, despite all those, you know, preventative measures that, you know, you still may develop some form of vein disease, but those are some ways to decrease your risk. So the treatment is really another way to also just decrease the uh, likelihood of you even getting them. So that's, yeah, that's so great. Compression stocking therapy. So um, you can get these at any medical supply store. You know, there's a, a lot of online sites um, I usually recommend a baseline pressure of 20 to 30. If that's too tight and pa some patients just can't tolerate it. Um, there are lower pressures. Um, truthfully, patients with a venous stasis also, we even recommend as high a pressure as 30 to 40, but those are, those are pretty tight. Um, you know, we recommend these obviously as, you know, a preventative measure. We recommend it in patients with leg swelling. We recommend it um, in patients with varicose veins, uh, venous stasis ulcers. But, you know, if someone has venous reflux and we've documented that with, with an ultrasound, then we also do recommend pursuing ablation therapy. Okay. So so just as a, an, another question, is there a trick to getting these compression socks on? because they're extremely hard to get on. Well, there's there's various forms. So I oftentimes recommend the knee highs. I think they're easier to get on the thigh high. And the highest pressure of your veins, just based off of gravity alone, is going to be on the lower leg. There's the zipper ones that you can see. Um, there are... Uh, there's a Velcro wrap. It's called a circade. So in patients that, you know, have a bad back, they can't bend over. Um, you know, patients that live alone that don't have someone to help them. These circades, it's almost like a sleeve and then almost like Velcro shoes. So those can be easier to put on. Um, some uh, medical supply stores have what's comparable to a shoehorn. It's just basically a, an aid in getting the stockings on. Oh, okay. That that's helpful because I know that they they, they can be. I'm not gonna lie. When I put them back on my patients in the office, I'm usually sweating. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, you know we've heard of something called the Unaboot. How is that different or better or what is that for? So the Unaboot is um, one of the oldest ways to treat venous stasis ulcers, um, and it's still one of the most efficacious. And I I do places in the office. Uh, for patients with wounds. So it's it's mostly for venous stasis ulcers. Um, it's The way I do it's three layers. The first one is almost like a calamine wrap. It's, it's like a gauze bandage wrapped in calamine. A lot of patients find this, you know, very soothing if they have a wound. Um, and then I put on two layers of, of ACE wrap bandages. Um, some people will just put on, you know, just uh, one layer of ACE wrap. These bandages are meant to stay on seven to 10 days. Um, you're not supposed to get them wet. Uh, they significantly decrease the time it takes to heal these ulcers, and it also prevents these ulcers from developing more ulcers or recurring. Okay. So are there other types of therapy or compression devices that we can use? So um, there are uh, compression boots. So basically you can get fitted for these boots in your house. Um, you can get knee high, you can get thigh high, and this works for leg swelling, venous stasis ulcers, as well as uh, lymphedema. These are made to be used uh, daily, oftentimes several times a day. Um, most patients like them just because they can do them in their home, uh, and they're very efficacious. And insurance covers them, you know, based off of proper indications. Oh, that's good, because that was one of our questions. Um, another question just related to some of the compression therapies, is there a time limit? I mean, I know you, you mentioned with the Unaboot, they're meant to stay on for seven to 10 days, but what about just the socks and the, those compression devices? So the socks I recommend to wear during the day, take them off at night. The problem with wearing them at night is when you're, they're, they're tight. Um, and so if it's too tight, it can cut into your skin. And when you're sleeping, you wouldn't know that. So I recommend wear them during the day, off at night. When you're sleeping, put some pillows underneath your legs to elevate the legs. 
Okay. And so then the next the next step would be, I guess, something more invasive. Can you tell us a little bit about the next step if the compression stuff is not working? So in patients that have an indication or, um, you know, have venous reflux on their ultrasounds, meaning the blood's flowing in the wrong way, I can treat the vein. So I'm always going to recommend compression stocking therapy, you know, even independent of having the procedure. But the procedure is pretty efficacious and it's minimally invasive. Back in the day, the only way to really treat veins was to strip them or basically remove them, um, which patients could be in the hospital for up to a week. This, you come in in the morning, the procedure takes about an hour. Um, it's under some form of anesthesia, depending on what you and the anesthesiologist want. You go home the same day, you can do whatever you want the following day. I don't take anything out of you. I don't leave anything in you. Um, I basically put an IV in the vein that's giving you the problem, most commonly the greater saphenous vein. Uh, through that IV, I can take the machine and bring it all the way up top, right by the groin area. And using thermal energy, I can cause the vein to scar down. So basically, I reroute your blood flow into veins that work. Wow. Is there um, any type of complications related to that procedure? So with the procedure, the main risks are infection, bleeding, like any procedure. I give you antibiotics to the vein before we start. You don't have to take anything afterwards. Um, you may experience a little bit of discomfort afterwards, um, as well as some bruising, uh, but that's all that's treated with Tylenol or ibuprofen. This is not something that you need Percocet or Dilaudid or anything like that. Um, I inject a special solution all around the leg to prevent the nerves, arteries, and skin from a burn from that machine, because again, it's using thermal energy. Uh, the last thing and most serious thing is a blood clot. I do this all under ultrasound. Um, and in the operating room, we make sure that there hasn't a, bl a blood clot hasn't formed. Two to three days after the procedure, we check another ultrasound to make sure, um, you know, a blood clot hasn't subsequently formed. If it did, I have to, you know, put the patient on some form of blood thinners for usually six weeks to three months. Um, but again, I, I haven't had, luckily, you know, I haven't had to put anyone on blood thinners. Okay. So um, how about, you know, just the swelling related to all of this stuff, you know, what, tell us a little bit about swelling of the legs, whether that's, you know, one side, both sides, you know, tell us, tell us more. So in terms of leg swelling, it can happen for many reasons. Um, it can happen from veins. It can happen in worsening CHF, renal failure, liver failure, um, but also it can occur with lymphedema. So lymphedema refers to the lymphatic system. That's just another way that the fluid travels in the body. It, it can also be a, you know, a mixed picture. It can be related to veins and lymphedema. Um, so lymphedema is a medical condition. Some people can be born with it. Some people can develop it, um, you know, years down the road. It can be related to trauma. It can just happen. Um, in terms of treatment, it's, it's medical therapy. It's, it's the lymphedema therapist. We actually have an excellent lymphedema uh, center at Inspira. It's right across the street from the hospital. Um, and it involves uh, things such as massage, um, to massage the lymphatics and basically drain the fluid out of the affected limb. Um, this is the same thing that they do for you know breast cancer patients after mastectomy. Um, here is just some pictures that you can see. So it can affect one leg and it can affect both. Um, some of the classic signs are actually swelling of the toes, um, you know, a, a dorsal hump or basically a swelling on the top part of the foot. Um, there's also something called lipedema where it's just an abnormal distribution of fat cells and it's pretty much treated in the same manner. Okay. So, you know, the saying prevention is the best medicine is, you know, always a good saying. And uh, it, it, does that hold true here as well? And is there something we can do to help prevent any type of vascular uh, disease? So the main thing that I tell my patients is you got to stop smoking. Even if you smoke your entire life, if you stop tomorrow, you're going to make a world of difference in terms of many things, your cancer risk, your breathing, your, you know, disease in your blood vessels. Um, optimize your risk factors. So, you know, if you're diabetic and you're having problems with your blood sugars, or even if you're not having problems with your blood sugars, it's important to, you know, get your feet checked regularly by a podiatrist, see an endocrinologist, see a neurologist if you're having issues with a diabetic neuropathy, 
part of the issues with you know having wounds that won't heal is patients can't feel their feet and so they sustain a wound uh, and that compounded with abnormal blood flow can be a real problem exercise to the best of your ability i'm not asking you to run marathons but just getting out and walking around the block several times you know a week whatever you can do to get out and about it helps your arteries and it helps your veins because when you're walking your calf muscles are contracting and that helps your veins work better um, you know, keep your cholesterol under control, keep your blood pressure under control, uh, try to observe a heart healthy diet, see a nutritionist if you're at all concerned. Um, you know, and again, the nutritionist will all, it not only help you with the diet, but give you an idea of what a healthy weight is. So now we have a couple of questions. I do want to just point out, um, uh, Dr. Graves has uh, referred to a nutritionist. We do have nutritionists and, um, and counselors available to you um, by just calling 1-800-INSPIRA. Um, you can get access to our nutritionist. So that's always a very good thing. And we do have a couple of questions um, uh, one of them says, um, if I, I sometimes wake up with numbness in my hands, um, is that related at all to anything that you've discussed and should, should that be checked out? So usually numbness in the hands, um, it can be related to carpal tunnel. Uh, it can be related to, you know, joint disease in the neck, uh, sometimes in patients with Raynaud's or Raynaud's is this hyperactivity to the cold. Um, but, you know, in general, numbness can be a sign of vascular disease. Um, if, if you're having numbness in your hands, if it's related to blood vessels, usually patients have pain in the hands when they're doing activities with their hands. But if you're at all concerned, it doesn't hurt to, you know, to come see us. You know, we can always, you know, check your pulses. We can actually, that same Doppler study that I showed you before with the blood pressure cuffs all up and down the legs, we can do that to your arms as well. And we can also do ultrasounds of the arms. So the one thing about vascular surgeons is we can see a wide range of problems. And even if we can't tell you what exactly is wrong with you, we can at least tell you it's not your blood vessel. So we can at least give you an answer. Right, right. So another question we have is, um, my toes stay bluish and cold all the time. Is that a circulatory problem and should I be concerned? So I see a ton of patients with blue toes. Um, I have blue toes. It can be related to Raynaud's disease. Some people just are born that way. Uh, some people with worsening arterial disease can have um, worsening discoloration of their toes and feet over time um, and coolness as well. So it can be a sign of an abnormality, but not necessarily. Um, if you're having pain related to that, then I would say, you know, I would be a little bit more concerned. But if it doesn't bother you, um, it may just be you. Um, but again, if you're all concerned, I see plenty of patients with blue feet that are perfectly fine. But you know, it, it makes them feel better to see a, you know, a vascular doctor to tell them that and to evaluate them head to toe to make sure there's not anything else causing, you know, the abnormality of the color. Right, right. Um, a couple other questions that we have. Um, one of them, uh, one of our people in the audience asks, if, do you treat varicose veins when the problem is really just cosmetic? So what I usually start, so any patient I see for veins, I'll always start with an ultrasound to see if the veins are working properly. Um, if they're not working properly, I usually start with the ablation therapy. Um, if, you know, if there's still veins that people are not happy with after the ablation, I can do what sounds awful, but it's called a staphylobectomy, or basically I remove the veins surgically. In terms of the spider veins and the reticular veins, there is something called sclerotherapy. Um, if they are bleeding, I can treat that uh, in the operating room in combination with the ablation therapy. But right now, I am not doing um, procedures that aren't covered by insurance. So oftentimes, unfortunately, uh, the reticular veins and the spider veins um, are not treated are not covered by insurance and they're usually treated with the sclerotherapy. So that is actually one of our questions if Medicare covers uh, some of those different treatments. Um, so I'm assuming so, it covers some of the boots and stuff like that. So maybe you can, if you know, if you can um, explain that. So Medicare is excellent at covering ablations. Um, they cover the procedure um, pretty well, and it doesn't take that long to have the procedure. Once you see me to have that procedure go through insurance with Medicare, it's pretty quick. Um, for the compression side, 
things. I will write, a, if, if I see you in the office, I will write you a script and some insurances will cover the compression stockings or at least part of them if, if given a script. The circades or the Velcro stockings that I had mentioned are actually quite expensive. They're like two to three hundred dollars, um, but in certain conditions, uh, insurance will cover that completely. So the different insurance are are tricky, but my office at this point, you know, we're kind of a pro at dealing with it. So, yeah, that's good because that's helpful because most of us have a really difficult time navigating through all that insurance stuff. Um, yeah, we'll so what are all that in office? Yeah, thank you. So um, the next question is for some of those treatments and, and treating the varicose veins, um, is, it, is it painful? Um, and then what is the recovery time for that? So the ablation procedure is, you, you may feel some bruising, uh, there may be some numbness uh, in the lower part of the leg, but most patients are up and about and, and feel well. Uh, some patients will even go back to work the following day. The main limitation is you need a ride because you get anesthesia. And I don't like people mm -hmm. doing heavy lifting for 24 hours. Um, but again, you don't need Percocet, you don't need Dilaudid. It's considered, um, you know, it's considered a procedure, not a surgery. Some physicians oh, will even do sort of thing in the office. Uh, I like doing it in the operating room just because I think it's cleaner and more comfortable for patients. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So does it matter where the varicose veins are? One of the question is um, that this person has uh, veins on the lower calf ankle and the top of the feet. Are they treatable just the same as if, yeah. you know, the ones yeah. that you were referring to? Yeah. yeah okay, so good. the, um, there's four main veins in each leg that I can treat. And what can happen is um, collaterals or those alternative uh, pathways for blood flow can happen in the veins too. So what you can see is varicosities or abnormal blood vessels coming off that main vein. So usually I try to treat the main vein and those varicose veins will go down in size and become less painful. And then any veins that are still remaining after that ablation procedure, I can treat surgically with removal. Okay. And the next question is, and I think you touched on this, but but just to verify, um, if you have a vein in your legs that puffs out and is a little tender to touch, what might this indicate? So it could just be, you know, a varicose vein that's acting up. Uh, sometimes due to whatever reason, if you bump it in the heat, uh, the veins can become inflamed. In the heat, the veins dilate naturally. Um, so it's not abnormal in the summer for swelling to worsen, varicose veins to worsen. Um, sometimes what can happen in the varicose veins is, you know, the blood flow in those abnormal veins is very slow and sluggish. So small little blood clots can form in those varicosities. That's called superficial thrombophlebitis. Um, it's usually treated with Tylenol, ibuprofen, a warm or a cool compress. Sometimes you can actually feel a hard area in those varicose veins. Um, and it may even turn red over that area. But if you're at all concerned, I recommend you go um, get an ultrasound, so whether it be an urgent care, your primary care doctor, or even the emergency room, because you want to make sure you don't have a, a deep vein thrombosis or a deep vein clot, because those are the clots that we have to put you on blood thinners for. Okay, okay. And we're doing very well on time, and we have one last question. Um, and this person has said that I have a fourth toe that turns purple when it's in the down position. When I put them up, they return to normal color. Um, both of my feet turn red when they are down. And I do have good fetal pulses um, and no pain. So just a question as to what that could indicate. So um, when you put your feet in the dependent position or you put them down, blood flow, there's increased blood flow. So that may be why they're turning um, red, uh, in terms of having a, a toe turn discolored, um, you know, it, it's, I have to see it to, to see what exactly the discoloration is. Um, sometimes, um, it's rare, but sometimes there can be, uh, pieces of clot up top that can break off and go to the toe and cause it to become purple. But usually that's very painful. Um, again, some people just have abnormally colored toes. Um, but again, I would urge you, if you are having any discomfort or if anything is worsening, to be evaluated. Okay. Well, that's all the questions that we have. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Graves, for sharing all your knowledge with us. 
Um, and I do need to acknowledge that whenever we put on um, these types of programs, there's a lot of planning and teamwork that gets done behind the scenes. I'd like to thank uh, Suzanne Plaskett Bauer and Lauren Clinton for their silent work, and as always, for helping us put these programs on for you. You're always here and working while you're enjoying the webinars. And I'll end with reminding you to stay home when you can, wash your hands, wear your masks, stay six feet apart, and stay safe. Uh, thank you for participating with us tonight. And Dr. Graves is available on your screen. You see uh, the Inspira Vascular Institute number. Um, you could call that number or the 1-800-INSPIRA number and be able to see Dr. Graves. So thank you very much, Dr. Graves. It was very informative. We appreciate it.